I've got some good news and bad news. The, the bad news is I don't know anything about rice. And the good news is I'm not going to talk very long, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, after seeing this presentation, I thought I should bring some of my own equipment. So you know, it's not quite the same degree of compl complexity, but it's at least, at least you see we use it too. Um, so the, what I'm going to try to, th to think about a little bit, we, our program, which is down at Hawthorne Valley Farm, which is in eastern New York State, we do a lot of looking at how nature and agriculture interact. Now, never have worked with rice. But I'm going to just talk a little bit about how we approach that. And then a few thoughts about rice paddies and how they might fit into the ecological landscape. And then talk a little bit about the project that Takeshi and I have been trying to think through and see if there's any interest. And if there's no interest, we won't do it. And if there's interest, then maybe we can, we can think about it. If you have any questions, you know, just go ahead. And as I said, some thoughts and questions, I don't have any answers. So, so this is um, a little bit just a background that I want to share that I think is probably obvious to most people. You know, and it took me a while to figure it out. So you throw the ball up, you get older, you throw it up again, and it lands on your head, and you know, finally it's dawned on me that you put up it. So all I wanted to, to say is that it's taken me a while to sort of perceive the obvious, and the obvious in this case, to me, is, you know, there's one view, I come from a conservation biology background, and there's sort of the view that, well, the important thing in this landscape is the nature, there's some other things going on here. And, you know, you get pretty pictures like this. Or there's the other view, well, the important thing that's going on here is the farming, and there's some other stuff around it. And, you know, there's all these reasons for doing farming. And all I want to say is that, you know, both of these are in the landscape. And I'm not going to try to stand up here and say, you know, you want to justify farming from nature conservation perspective, or that you want to justify the nature conservation from the perspective of the benefits it provides to agriculture. But they're both in the landscape. So how, if you, if you agree these both have value, and you're not going to say one is more than the other, how do you find the synergies? And that's, that's been the philosophy that we've been trying to work with. Does that make sense? They said it's, um, so how do we emphasize the synergies? And of course, you know, there are ways that it interacts. Some of these, some of these habitats in the cultivated land actually are important for nature conservation. Some of the wild species that you have up here do provide services to the agriculture. So how can you accentuate the positive, essentially? So one of the things that has helped us as we try to think about, OK, you have, a, say, an agricultural habitat, be it a rice paddy, be it a grain field, whatever. You know, how do you think about that, that fitting into the landscape ecologically? This happens to be some mapping we did. This is Hawthorne Valley Farm. The farm is actually here. This is more or less what it looks like today. You've got Deconic State Thruway here, Parkway. Uh, you've got forest. You've got fields. You've got other forest here. This is maybe what that same place looked like 500 years ago. So the question becomes, you know, where did the organisms that live in this landscape where do they live in this landscape? And as you think about this, you realize that 500 years ago, there were certain habitats that existed in this landscape that you don't see very much today. For example, there's a hill over the farm is actually here right now. This is a high, fairly dry soiled hill. It burned relatively frequently in all probability. We don't let it burn. I mean, we actually had a fire this year right here and you know, the volunteer fire department was on top of it. You know, it it didn't get very big. It got about the size of this room, maybe a little bit more. There used to be a lot more beaver. I mean, we have beaver now, but not nearly the number that there were historically. And they have a huge effect on the landscape also. So there were some habitats that existed 500 years ago that we don't have today. Likewise, today, we have some habitats that didn't exist, five, that didn't exist 500 years ago. So we have things like a lot more man-made ponds, we have a lot more agricultural fields. And the question becomes, you know, can you actually find some ways in which those new habitats for some organisms 
can replace some of those old habitats. We're not talking about restoration. What we're talking about is what we call ecological analogies. So, you know, you would, ha you would have had in that historical landscape post-fire shrubland. The fire comes through, <coughs> things get, oops, sorry about that. Um, a fire comes through, the, the vegetation gets burnt down, you get shrubbery coming back up. And there's certain native species that are used to this. Well, this is not the same thing, but a post-cow shrubland offers an analogy that works for some species. Not all of them, it's not the same thing, but for some species it works. So that's the idea of the ecological analogy. You know, they're not the same, but for some species it works ecologically. This is another example. This is a beaver pond. You know, you have the beaver dam, you've got the, the surrounding wetlands and the surrounding pond. This is a cattle pond. There's no beaver in there. It's not the same thing. But some of the, for example, some of the dragonflies that you might have around the edges, you also find here. So it's, you try to say, okay, we want to work with both of these. How can we, can we work with the agricultural habitats and provide some analogies that work for certain species. Does that make sense? So the, an the question here, you know, where, do they f where do these organisms find a home? Well, I'd say the answer is, the ones that are still around, some aren't because they couldn't find a home. Some, the answer is where they find the analogies. You know, between the beaver meadows here, the wet areas there, the burn, and maybe some of the dry pastures, um, thin soil pastures in the so the question then becomes, what's the analogy that we're working towards or can we conceive of for a rice paddy? And how can you have production and yet perhaps also benefit some species that are looking for habitat? Okay, so far? Is it a vernal pool? So how many, how many people here know vernal pool? <laughs> There's a vernal pool. The so most people? It's a, a vernal pool is a, is a seasonal pool and I was actually reminded of vernal pools in one of the presentations here. What was the name of the rice? The Auschweiz? Is there an Auschweiz? A very short growing, how do you say it? Ausch. Ausch? Yeah, you know, a very short growing season. Well, that's sort of what the, the amphibians that live in a vernal pool. A vernal pool, it's called vernal from the Latin for spring of the year. It fills up in spring, dries out in the autumn, and so you have certain, you have certain uh, frogs and salamanders that rush into this try to grow really quickly, which was re what reminded me of the, the rice variety, grow really quickly and get out before this dries up. What do you suppose the advantage to the frog is of trying to make, of trying to have that lifestyle? No, no, fish, fish. no fish, right, because it dries out. So, so is this, you know, are some of the organisms that are associated with these sorts of pools, is that an analogy? Is that, might that be occurring in some of the, the rice paddies? Or is it the beaver meadow? You know, is, again, are, do you have some organisms that might live here that you might be able to find or encourage in a rice paddy? For whom? You know, who, who are the species that this works for? And just had to put up some, you know, this is what I spend my day doing, so you gotta suffer through some butterfly slides. Um, but these are all wetland butterflies. This is a, <laughs> if any of you are baseball fans, what do you suppose, where do you suppose this might be named? Or, well, it's actually Baltimore. <laughs> so the Oriole, che the Baltimore checker spot. Uh, this is a bronze copper. That's one of the browns. This is a mulberry wing with a cross on it. These are just some of the organisms that you, you, know, you might be getting in these habitats. Uh, ribbon snake. Have any of you actually seen spotted salamanders? <laughs> any of you seen them in rice paddies? No. Okay, no, and it might not. You know, maybe it doesn't work for me. Toads. Uh, this happens to be leopard frog in our area. And those are... The, the beautiful dragonflies, I was just out in the, the rice paddy here, I don't know how many of you saw them that were flying around, it's just, it's a... And so the answer in terms of, you know, what is the analogy is, we don't know. And which, we haven't looked at it yet. And so that kind of leads to this, the thing that I wanted, this is what something that Keishi and I have been talking about, a study to look at this. And I just wanted the last, I told you this, was, this would be quick, I just want to, this actually hap I should give a plug here. This happens to be Yong Yuk's paddy. Um, so they live up the road from Hawthorne Valley Farm and they're growing rice here. And he talks about when he was a, a kid looking at the, the dragonflies that were occurring in his rice paddy. So this is one of the, the places. 
How big is the rice paddy? Yeah. He has two of them now, and they've got to be actually thinking about it. It's pre maybe each of them is maybe twice the size of this room, something like that. It's I think twice the size of this hour. Yeah. So, but he's got this one, and then he's got another one like over here that they put in. So this is you know the justification for. I mean, apart from the fact that I you know like nature and this. Um, I think it's a neat time to be talking about this because, as Susan was saying earlier on, rice growing is novel in the sense, in this region. Of course, it's not novel historically. But there's still models being formed and there's public expectations being formed. And so it's a chance to say, okay, you know, let's, let's see if we can bring a little bit of this in now as things are starting up. Um, Wetlands are definitely rare and declining in the Northeast. I mean, if you look at different states, I don't have the exact statistic, but it's 80, 90 percent decline historically in the amount of wetlands for a variety of reasons. And finally here, you know, we have what I'd say would be the geographic and cultural space to do this in the sense that you have culturally, there's a population that's interested in local food, interested in the environment. You know, there's, a, there's some possibilities of actually getting support this way. And although the land is relatively expensive, uh, it is fairly abundant. You've got, you've, got way, you've got a little bit of room to play. So the components of this study, what we've talked about, are three. What do experiences elsewhere, especially in temperate regions, have to tell us about rice paddy ecology? What native organisms do we currently find in regional rice paddies? What roles do they play? And from what we know to date, how might one design an ecological rice paddy system. And it's not that anybody's going to take that blueprint and say, okay, this is exactly what I'm going to do, but just sort of to help you think about some of these things. And I just briefly, this is a, you know, what do experiences elsewhere have to tell us about rice paddy? So I just made sure to put this in here. This is the, the rice paddy on Mont Blanc. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, what, what are the natural niches of native species which use rice paddies elsewhere in the world? So try. I mean, there's so, been so much work done. Can we learn from some of that as we go into this? What roles, positive or negative, do these play in rice paddy production? Uh, these being those native species. How do they interact with rice paddy ecology? And has anybody elsewhere really studied the role of paddies in biodiversity conservation? And there was, some, there was a, actually a professor here from UC Davis talking about the waterfowl and rice paddy interactions in uh, California, where they've actually done a lot of work trying to uh, accentuate that. So that's the first component. You know, what native organisms do we currently find in regional rice paddies and what roles do they, pe what roles do they play? Just finding out that answer. We just don't know around here who's going to be coming to this. We can make some guesses and the, the hope would be, can we put together a field guide so that if you've got a rice paddy, you know, you're not going to spend all your time doing this for sure, but if you've got a rice paddy, you know, we'll, what frogs are you hearing? What dragonflies are you seeing? What salamanders are you seeing? You know, trying to help, what butterflies? Just giving you the tools so that also you can feed back and say, oh, this is what we're finding. And that helps us, okay, here's something that we can kind of accentuate. Here's something we can encourage. That clear so far? Yeah. And then finally, and I'm sorry, Takeshi, I stole this photograph from, from you. Uh, but from what we, and I, that's actually for a reason because Takeshi would actually be very important in this part. I have no experience in designing rice paddies or anything like that. But based on his experience, the shared experience here, what we find in doing some of that initial work, can we put together an easily, illust uh, sort of easy to follow, an illustrated set of tips, designs for what might make the, the rice paddy system most ecological in terms of, you know, where do you put it in the landscape? How do you design the different components? Um, so that is actually the, you know, I just was, I wanted to put that up there and see if you had any, uh, see if you had any questions or comments. Does this seem useful? Is this something like, um, and I'd love to, we, you know, it'd be a matter of putting together a set of collaborators. So, <laughs> yeah. So I, um, uh, I was thinking about this, you know, um, I'm from New Jersey, and New Jersey we've got lots of laws about wetlands. Wetlands are really protected, um, and I don't think that, any, that in any pre-existing wetland you'd be able to have any sort of success 
convincing your town that you should throw rice in it, you know, because of the amount of different species uh, that you, you know, find in the few the healthy weapons left in New Jersey. Um, but I'm wondering if there's any other examples of wetland agriculture, whether it be like wild rice or cranberries or something like that, uh, to see as, to use as a precedent, as an example, to say, oh, well, you know, the cranberry bogs caused this sort of, you know, pollution or something like that. There's an, an analog within agriculture to rice that would, um, could be used to like set the precedent if you know if say I wanted to do my hometown like oh I have this wetland I want to plant rice in it and the environmental commission's like no you can't do that right. um, is there any sort of analogs in agriculture that you can think of that would be appropriate to prepare the uh, there may well be that I don't know of I would say it uh, yeah and the one that that comes to mind immediately which is not quite the same but in our situation in the southern part of the, the region where we work there are fens, or these calcareous right. meadows. And if you didn't keep those grazed, they would go back up into forest. You'd have wetland forest, which would be interesting. Right. However, there are certain species, like an endangered bog, bog turtle, that occurs in those open meadows. Right. And if, if it was not kept open by grazing, or you could do it some other way, those wouldn't be there. Right. Bog so, turtles actually rely in some way on cattle being there, right? Well, it relies on it being open. Right. And you know, cattle. So cattle could do that. Um, that's one of the, the ways. I've also heard about the bog turtles using the footprints to nesting in, or something oh, like that be. in the cattle footprints. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I can answer his question, but only as to Massachusetts, because that's the only state I'm authorized to practice law in. But the answer to the question in most states is probably a legal one. In Massachusetts, the answer to his question is, do not go anywhere near a wetland or the Conservation Commission and the State Department of Environmental Protection and possibly the Army Corps of Engineers will collectively turn your life into a living hell unless you're fortunate enough to be a local person in a small town where nobody gives a damn, okay? But legally, in Massachusetts, for example, the field where we are growing rice, I have no doubt is an historic wetland. Because it has been farmed for 300 years, we can do basically anything we want without regard to the Massachusetts Wetlands Act. So we, for example, could do what you're suggesting without running the risk that the environmental butterfly people, excuse me, will land and say, oh, you've created this beautiful environment. Don't ever set foot with your damned rice again. We're going to preserve it, and it's legally protected. Whether that sort of exemption for agriculture exists in other states, I don't know. But if somebody who was my client came to me, and with your idea, I'd say the first thing is make sure you are not going to create a wetland environment that's going to destroy your agriculture. Right, and I would definitely, I'm not at all encouraging you to go into a natural wetland and do this. I'm saying, you know, if you're, and I think that's part of what Takeshi and yeah, I would be working on. Massachusetts, your idea is a great one. And it, I mean, in New York State, it's a bit looser, uh, for good or for bad, but I, it's still obviously a concern. And I wouldn't, from an ecological perspective, I would not suggest you replace a natural wetland. Because right. you're never going to get that good in terms of the... Oh, yeah. it's, it's always going to be this sort of... But in, in the situations like this, the question becomes, you know, you have an area that's been in agriculture, it's a wet meadow, how can you make that better for ecology while also having your production? And you're right about replication. In Massachusetts, the law provides for replicating up to 5,000 square feet of wetland, and it is a standing in joke because yeah. everybody who's involved with it knows that it is absolutely impossible. Wetlands are replicated. Consultants and plant and animal breeders make a fortune, and everybody walks away knowing it's never going to work, but it satisfies the law, yeah. and it's, it's sad. I've seen them, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was actually going to ask about the Massachusetts Wetland Act, I think that would be a number of battles. 
probably not a very good um, But if you to find out if the rice paddy can perform some of the natural functions of wetland, mm -hmm. then I think you can make some very good cases for actually using them to improve water quality to for carbon. Uh -huh. No, I think there's very much you know, this is one this is one way of looking at the ecology white of rice paddies. And there's certainly and I think some people have done that, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think some of that has been done at the international scale. And it's certainly another way to go. And it's it's not it's not where I have come from, um, but it's it's got lots of value. Yeah, I I agree with what you just said, but I think that there's a lot of interest. Um, yeah, I just came from this agroecology course up at UVM, and we talked a lot there about the role, the potential role of rice in um, flood control and also in, yeah, flood control in water when you have these heavy rainfall, you know, preventing the water from going somewhere else. Um, so, I mean, this whole idea of multifunctional agricultural systems, I think, could really be promoted. I just wanted to add the thing I was mentioning to you earlier that I think I, I think the collaborative project idea is great, and it would be great if it could be linked somehow to the marketing aspect of the rice of our northeast rice to try to yeah to try to market it as an ecologically grown rice that you know I think that fits in with our whole you know image and the that we're we're the you know upfront on environmentally sound practices in general and growing this rice that's not only you know using organic methods but it's really keeping in mind the larger ecological issues and if we can cooperate on that and somehow promote our rice in that way I think it would be really killing the you know, <laughs> Well, we're about ready to embark on our rice cultivation adventure, and um, we are including an ecologist on our team who will be doing benthic monitoring of pond below where we're growing, um, doing a baseline study first, and then monitoring to see what changes might come about through the, the flowage that um, we might be impacting. So you're talking about looking at the macro invertebrates that, yeah. so there's, there's if, a pond at the base mm -hmm. of this system that ducks and limited help us fill, and he's going to uh, analyze what's going on in there before. Yeah. So if you're not aware, if you haven't seen this, that there are, there are ways of assessing water quality by looking at the different mm -hmm. kinds of larvae that live there. Mm -hmm. And so by looking at the ecology in this, the pond at the end, you're, getting it, you're starting to get a little bit of that water quality. There's um, U.S. Geological Survey's has um, ground truthing for um, for whirlpools, and so there are, there's already a network of not, not just whirlpools, but there's already a network of people who are <coughs> frogs. Yep. For, for example, can you tap into that data? Um, I don't know if they. Use, I don't think they're counting rice paddies. Yeah, they're not counting <laughs> rice paddies, but well, I wonder if those those people uh, uh, would be willing to to um, also include a rice paddy. So rice paddies uh, or, or other like But I mean, there definitely are other habitats, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah conceivably. I think it, especially if you get the sort of tools together so you know what you're looking for and you can make it simple and say, you know, these, this is what you're... This is what we want you to do. This is what we want you to do. You yep. Yeah, when, when I think about designing an acre or so or acre plus of rice paddies on the land that I'm on, some of the questions that I've been thinking about and that you brought up with trying to make it more in line with the, an ecosystem, a natural ecosystem, is one, what to do with, it's great that the, the rice paddy can absorb water too, but let's say you're giving it a lot of fertilizer or you know even organic nutrients and then you get a, a huge flood from there, then that's gonna flood into your water stream. So even thinking about past the right, you know, the paddy system, mm -hmm. whether it's a pond or whether right. it's okay. bushes or something, because I know for us, if we were to just have a lot of nutrients in there that's just going to flow into the Kennebec River if, it, if, it, if, it, um, if we get a flood or something. So that's something that I was thinking about. And also just the areas, because if we just made an acre and a half of rice paddies, okay, that's going to create a big pond, but it'd be nice to have, if there's a few different paddies, I don't know if you have like a 10-foot or 20-foot area between them where you're growing native shrubs or 
some area where there's not rice paddy and, and not grass either, but uh, something that's has that diversity. Yeah. yeah. And, and so hopefully that would be something that I, I know Takeshi has talked a little bit about the whole hydrological system and how it works. Mm -hmm. yeah. Might be interested in participating in this, please let me know either now or you can email me or whatever. <laughs> well, consider, where are you located? Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia? Oh, that's cute. I'm actually Canadian. So. Well, I won't hold that against you. We do have a spot. 